Bueno, muy buenas tardes eh, a todos los participantes de este webinar. Tal como les comentamos en la conferencia, no queríamos perder eh, la oportunidad de que ustedes pudiesen conversar y tener esta sesión con nuestro experto internacional en liderazgo académico, Jeffrey Buller. Entonces, bueno, como algunos de ustedes saben, hubo un retraso con el vuelo, entonces queríamos planear esta sesión hoy con Jeffrey. Entonces, les cuento un poquito del perfil de Jeffrey. Jeffrey es el director de liderazgo y desarrollo organizacional en la Florida Atlantic University y es un miembro fundador y senior partner en el eh, programa Atlas de Liderazgo. Él tiene un doctorado de la Universidad de Wisconsin-Madison y ha publicado más de 18 libros en todo lo referente al liderazgo académico, especialmente en el contexto de universidad de educación superior. Eh, aparte de eso, bueno, es un experto que también ha hecho cientos de artículos en liderazgo académico y usualmente trabaja este tipo de talleres con eh, miembros de educación superior y universidades. Entonces, bueno, la conferencia o el taller va a ser el webinar, va a ser en inglés, pero queremos darle esta introducción en español. Eh, luego de acabar este webinar, le vamos a publicar, vamos a grabar esta sesión y se las vamos a publicar y compartir para que tengan también la oportunidad de volverla a ver. Ok. Thank you, Jeff, for being with us today. Ah, sorry. Eh, estamos obviamente, it was a, cha a shame that Colombia couldn't uh, win, but we would like to have this space with you because we know it's going to be really interesting and productive and fruitful. So, welcome to Tony Norte. Uh, it was also a shame that you couldn't be here on Friday, but now you're here and um, we know you're going, we're going to enjoy this space with you and this conversation. Thank you, Fadia. And I hope maybe uh, uh, over the course of the conversation we can have people uh, forget the troubles that they, <laughs> they just experienced <laughs> in, in watching the game and, and uh, uh, focus on, on the future. What I wanted to talk about uh, today was uh, this uh, notion of how we lead as academic leaders because uh, universities today are, are in such need of uh, dynamic leadership with the, the world changing and higher education changing. And in some ways, it's interesting in terms of the way in which we prepare people to become academic leaders, which in most universities and in most university systems is we don't prepare them at all. Uh, that was certainly the case when I became a department chair. I found out I was a department chair with no preparation, no training whatsoever. And this happens frequently uh, throughout higher education. We prepare people to become chemists and historians and accountants and, and research scientists, but when they become department chairs and when they become deans, they then don't have the skills they need to run a meeting effectively or uh, achieve consensus, uh, resolve conflict. And so what a lot of uh, new academic leaders do is what I did when I became department chair, and that is to go out and find all the books you can about how to be a boss, how to be a leader, or how to be in charge. And one of the things you quickly find is that the advice you encounter in those books is absolutely of no use whatsoever in running most university programs. And the reason for that is uh, related to the topic of today's uh, program, and that's that academic leaders simply have to lead differently than we do in, in other situations. So. There we go. Why are so many things that we tend to learn about leadership in uh, popular books about leadership or academic studies about leadership, why are, are so many of those concepts out of place in higher education? Why don't they seem to relate to what we actually do at college or uh, university? Well, um, one of the reasons is that the sort of organizational culture we tend to have at most colleges and universities is if not unique, then rather distinctive. What you're looking at now is the structure of a hierarchical organization, what we sometimes call a social pyramid. Hierarchical organizations, they're probably the most common types of organization that human beings have had throughout all of their history. And in a hierarchical organization, what happens is that power increases as you go up the ranks, and numbers of people increase as you go down the ranks. So fewer and fewer people are in the uh, upper echelons or the upper levels of the hierarchy, but they have the most power. And you see this sort of uh, arrangement in most military organizations. 
You have a commander-in-chief at the top of the social pyramid who's able to decide strategy, uh, make the major decisions, uh, cancel other uh, decisions that have been made uh, below that level, and ultimately holds a great deal of power. Under the commander-in-chief, you have generals who have a great deal of authority, not as much as the commander-in-chief, but at the same time, there are more generals. And as you go down through the various ranks, power becomes diluted. So you have more and more people at each level with less and less power. That tends to be the structure that you find, too, in the corporate world. One CEO or chief executive officer at the top of the organization who has a great deal of authority, uh, more vice presidents with a good deal of authority, not as much as the CEO, but certainly more than the directors and the managers and the employees below them. And again, as you go through the various levels, you have less and less uh, power. Well, in higher education, we tend to structure ourselves the same way. If you look at the organizational charts of any college or university anywhere in the world and look at the academic side of the institution. You'll have one person at the top, a president or maybe a chancellor or a rector, depending on the terminology, terminology that's used. Below that person, a number of vice presidents. Below that person, a number of deans, chairs, and faculty. And in some ways, that reflects how we structure ourselves. Faculty members report to chairs, chairs report to deans, deans report to vice presidents, and the vice presidents report to the president. But when it comes to how the actual work of a university gets done, how major decisions get made, especially on the academic side of the institution, that structure doesn't reflect actual patterns very well. For instance, if you look at how curricular decisions are made, Usually, curricular decisions are begun either by an individual faculty member or by a committee of faculty members who then pass them to the chairs for approval, who pass them to the deans for approval, and that curricular proposal works its way up the social pyramid, not down the social pyramid, in the, in the way that structure and decisions and authority is supposed to run in that sort of hierarchy. So why do we say we're structured? this way, and yet we have a structure that doesn't fit the way in which we actually work and make decisions in higher education. Well, the answer to that question reveals a lot of what we need to know in terms of how we can lead more effectively in a college or university environment. One of the reasons is this. Most hierarchical organizations are very monolithic. It's like a single block. You know who your boss is, you know who your boss's boss is, you know what your job description is, and you know what you're supposed to do. And in a lot of organizations, what you do is pretty much the same thing every day. But when you turn from that structure to a university, you have something that looks more like this. It's what I call a pyramid of pyramids, or sometimes the never-ending pyramid. And what I mean by that is, is the following. If you're a faculty member, brand new faculty member in a department, and you don't agree with the way things are running. You don't think that the curriculum really meets the needs of the students, or you don't think that the number of meetings that you're having is appropriate for what you need to have done, and you want to change things. You might feel mm, that you don't quite have the authority to change that yet, but you might be thinking, if I could just get to be chair, if I could run the department, I could make all those decisions because then I'm going to have power. But if you get yourself appointed chair, or at some universities elected chair, what you immediately find is you're not at the top of any pyramid at all. You're actually at the, at the bottom of another pyramid. Uh, and so you're just one of the chairs who's reporting to the dean. So you might feel, if I could just get to be the dean, then I'll, I'll have the power. Then I can control the levers of this organization. And if you get yourself appointed to be dean, you find out that you're just at the bottom of another pyramid with all the deans reporting to the provost. Now you might say that the provost is in charge of all academic affairs. This is the vice president that controls everything academic at the institution. If I could just get to be the provost, then I could make those decisions and I could really change that department the way I wanted. Well, you get to be provost, you find you're just one of the vice presidents reporting to the president. You could even be the president of the organization and find out that you still can't control everything because there still is some sort of board or the legislature, or some other body that sets policies that, that control even what the presidents do. So one of the things that's distinctive about the social pyramid in higher education is that there is never any top 
to this pyramid. You never get to be in a position where a Steve Jobs or another leader of a, of a corporation can actually call the shots and make a decision, say, we want this product to come on the market and it's going to be on the market in three months and we're going to advertise it this way. Never in higher education do you get to be in a position where you can force all of those decisions down the social pyramid, which means that we can't lead in the same way that people lead in the corporate world or the military world or the athletic world. We have to lead in a way that makes sense for the, the environment of higher education. Now, this is a decentralized organization. This is pure democracy. In a decentralized organization, each member of that organization is equidistant from power. So nobody's ever completely in charge. And to get something done in this type of organization, you can't just demand that it be so. You can't just decree it. What you have to do is you have to build alliances because in the example that you're seeing on the screen right now, we have six members of this group. Each one of those members has one sixth of the power. So one sixth of the power doesn't do anything, but if you can form an alliance and maybe all of you come to consensus, then you've got six sixths of the power. Then you've got power, you can make a decision, you can move forward. Sometimes that's not possible but maybe four of you could put your four little pieces of power that can outweigh that of the other two and take a vote and outvote the other people. And again, you can move forward, but nobody can do anything alone because you're not ruling from the top of a pyramid. You're sort of ruling or trying to rule in consensus and in conjunction with other people in this different type of structure. Well, that structure is every committee you ever sat on. And it helps explain why sometimes Committees in higher education can drive you crazy because you have a discussion, the discussion goes on, people are raising the same points over and over and over again, and you finally think we're going to get to a decision, we're finally going to come to a vote, and somebody in the back of the room says, but you know, and then you discuss the issues over and over. Two weeks from now, you're going to have the same meeting and have the same discussions. Well, the reason is that power is so decentralized, it's very difficult for anyone to say, all right, this is what we're going to do, and here's how we're going to move ahead. Now, another type of organization that we need to know about is the distributed organization. In a distributed organization, each branch of that organization does have supreme power. They are at the top of their own pyramid but they have power over different things. So for instance, the distributed organization you're looking at now, that's the United States federal government. The executive branch can make certain decisions. They can declare war, for instance. They can set certain policies. The judicial branch uh, interprets the laws. They have uh, supreme authority over uh, what the law means. And the legislative branch sets the laws. So each one of those branches has its own authority. And the important thing to understand about how a distributed organization works is that each one of those branches has a sort of veto power over the others. That's really clear in the case of the executive branch. If the legislature passes a law that the president doesn't like, president vetoes, it can't be put into effect. But if the legislature passes a law that the judicial branch doesn't like, they can say it's non-constitutional and they can block it from going into effect. Even the executive branch can be blocked. The executive branch uh, declares that a policy is going to be in place. The legislative branch, which controls the budget, may not fund that initiative. Or the judicial branch may say it's contrary to the law. So in this type of organization, each one of the, the uh, branches has checks and balances over the other that keeps them from ruling in an autonomous way. Well, I mention this because in some ways, universities do function this way. There is a board or perhaps a legislature that sets major policies for the institution. There's the upper administration, the president, the provost, the other vice presidents who interpret those policies. And there's the faculty that implement those policies. And all of those uh, boards, all of those groups have veto power over the others. So that if the faculty want to do something that the board uh, uh, doesn't want to approve, they can just uh, declare that a new policy uh, prohibits that from taking place. If the board passes a policy the administration doesn't like, the administration 
interprets the policy in a new way. And administrations do this all the time. The, the letter of the law says this, but what we, we interpret that to mean for our institution is this. And ultimately they change that policy through their interpretation. And the faculty too have their own sort of veto power. If they don't like a decision that the board has made or the upper administration has made, after all, they're teaching the classes, they can drag their feet, they can slow things down in committee, they can wait out administrators until they're replaced by other administrators, and in certain situations, in certain environments, if the worst thing happens, some faculty members even go on strike to veto the decisions that are made elsewhere in the organization. So there are some ways in which universities function with this sort of distributed organizational structure in this uh, uh, concept that we call shared governance. Now another type of organization is a matrix organization. This is something that you really find mostly in the corporate world. In a matrix organization, you have your different divisions. So you, uh, you have your division that, that you're reporting to, your uh, supervisor uh, uh, evaluates you in, in that division, you report upwards. But also you have a great deal of lateral responsibility. So we're looking at uh, this example of a matrix organization. This is Apple computers. So you've got your division of products and the different product managers are in charge of different products the iPod, the iPad, iTunes, the Macintosh computer, whatever. But that project manager cannot bring that product to market alone. They have to depend upon someone from the design staff, someone from the manufacturing staff, uh, someone from the finance staff, someone from uh, marketing, and someone from human resources. So in a matrix organization, you have lateral uh, responsibility because you need your colleagues in the different divisions to help you do your job. Each one of those divisions cannot exist separately. Well, we don't work exactly that way in higher education, but we do function uh, a little bit in a modified matrix uh, uh, way when we defer to other aspects of our institution in the various decisions that are made. So for instance, you might have a promotion committee where uh, a group from across the university is deciding whether someone from the Department of Education should be granted the rank of full professor. And you might hear someone from literature say, I, I don't really know the field of education. I don't know what the qualifications are. But if you're telling me that this person meets your qualification, I'll vote for your candidate. And I'll expect you to vote for my candidate if I say the same thing. But I, you know, I'm dependent upon your professional knowledge to tell me what a full professor of education looks like. Similarly, on a university-wide curriculum committee, someone from the area of physics might say to someone in accounting, I don't know what a doctoral level course in accounting looks like. I don't even, can't even imagine what a dissertation in accounting would be like. But if you're telling me that this course for your doctoral program is absolutely required, I'll vote for your course. Just remember to vote for my course when it comes along. So we have this same sort of informal lateral uh, dependency that you find in matrix organizations. Well, why all of that is important is that if you're a leader who wants to bring about change and you want to get something done, it's a lot easier in this sort of environment where either you're at the top of the pyramid or it's your, you're at the top of one of the levels that uh, uh, you have in the structure where you can demand that certain things be done by a certain date and the change is initiated. That's a lot easier to have change occur than when you're trying to juggle all of these organizations. And that's what we do in higher education all the time. We do certain things by committees. We do certain things by this distributed organization. We do other things because we're dependent upon our colleagues for their professional knowledge. This slows down the process. And it means that the sorts of things that leaders have to do to accomplish change and to make a meaningful uh, uh, alteration in their programs uh, can take a very, very long time. So when we're developing our skills as leaders, we have to have the right skills to succeed in our environment. If this were a corporation, if this were a military unit or an athletic unit, the sort of skills we would want to teach are things like decision making and vision and authority and command and persistence, because that's what you need to drive down decisions through the organization. And by the way, that's what a lot of the leadership books teach. That's why when we in higher education go and take a look at a lot of the books that are written about how to lead, 
we look at them and go, I, I can't do that. I don't have this relationship with the colleagues in my department or in my, my program. I can't just insist on my vision or use my authority to command them to do things. Because sometimes we're working as a member of a committee and the sort of skills you need to succeed as a committee member are consensus building, collaboration, being able to see different perspectives, to be able to see different ways of looking at an issue you may not have thought of before, and merging alternatives, hearing two members say different things and finding a point of uh, commonality between them. So you can see if, if you're working in this sort of environment and you try to lead as you might lead a corporation, and you come in and you act very authoritative and you command other people in terms of what they have to do, that's not very effective in a committee. If you've ever known a faculty member who's ever tried to do that, you notice what happens is they don't get more power, they get less and less power because people isolate them and they start to form their own alliances without that person. Again, if you want to lead in this sort of organization uh, where each type branch of the organization has veto power over the others, you have to be able to negotiate. You have to be able to say, uh, look, as the members of the faculty, we understand the board wants this to, to occur. Well, you may want that to occur. We want higher salaries, or we want more research funding, or we want uh, a, a better travel assistance. We'll give you this, we'll be able to initiate uh, this new course structure that you want. We'll approve the courses that you want if you give us these things that we want. So being able to negotiate in that sort of environment, that's a, just a, a prerequisite for effective leadership in a lot of academic settings. So you have to be able to compromise. You have to be able to speak well so you can uh, represent your points effectively to someone who may not look at the world the same way that you do. You have to be able to be persuasive. And if we're going to be working in this sort of modified matrix environment, you have to show professional respect. If you rely on your colleagues and other disciplines to vote for your courses and your candidates, you can't act as though your discipline is the only one that matters. You have to be able to treat other people with respect, to bring a little humility to the situation, to work with your colleagues, and to be able to build rapport. So what I'm saying is that when we train academic leaders, we have to train them differently from the way in which we prepare leaders for other sorts of environments. They need different skills to succeed because their organizational culture, their environment is different. Now, how are you going to get things done when we do that, when we, we teach you how to negotiate and when we teach you how to communicate effectively and we teach you how to uh, compromise? How do, you, how do you get things done? Well, for a moment, let's think of your power, uh, the source of your, your, your power, your strength, as your ability to get done the things you believe you need to get done. It's a very famous essay by John French and Bertram Raven, pretty old now, goes all the way back to 1962, which says that there are a lot of different bases of social power, a lot of different ways people get power in an organization. But they say if you break these down to the most important ones, there are five most important ways in which you get to have power in an organization. First of all, there's referent power. Referent is power is when someone does something because they like you and they're willing to defer to you because they like you. If you're in a relationship with someone and you end up going to a movie that maybe you didn't particularly want to see, but the other person did, and you say, all right, you know, it's me because I love you, we'll go to this movie. That's referent power. That's when we defer to other people because we, we care about them individually. Then they say there's expert power. Expert power is, is the power that my doctor has over me. When my doctor says, I need to run this test, or I need to perform this operation, you know, I don't let just anyone decide to operate on me, but my doctor has expert knowledge I don't have. In fact, there's a famous saying about this, uh, it goes all the way back to the early part of the 20th century by Dr. Franz Engelfinger, who says that where the physician's power comes from is that the patient has to believe in that physician. The patient has to have a conviction that the doctor has some special knowledge the patient doesn't possess. And so uh, a patient is almost sometimes dominated by the doctor who says, you've got to lose weight and you've got to do these. Advice we wouldn't take from a lot of other people. We wouldn't even accept them from a lot of our friends. But because we embody this doctor with expert power, they have power over us. 
In addition, there's things like legitimate power. Legitimate power is the power you have because uh, the bylaws or the constitution or the rules say you do. Look, it says right here in my business card, I'm the dean. The dean gets to make certain decisions, so I'm going to make this decision. It's legitimate. Right? That's legitimate power. Then there's reward power. Reward power is when we have power over people because we can do things they want us to do. They're nice to us because we can give them travel money or we can do things that are favors to them. And then there's coercive power. That's the power we have over people, and they'll do what we want because they know that we could make their life very, very unpleasant. Well, as an academic leader, we have all of those powers. Sometimes people will do things because they like us, because we're charismatic figures. Sometimes they do things because we're experts in that field. And we say, look, as an organic chemist, I know we need this piece of equipment, and they'll fund it because we know our field and they don't. Sometimes we have legitimate power because that's what our bylaws say. Sometimes we have reward power. People do things because they want us to write them a letter of recommendation when they come up for promotion, or they want us to allocate them some travel money. And we also do have coercive power. We can punish people or we can make their lives uncomfortable. But here's the important thing that academic leaders have to realize. All of those powers have a price but the most expensive one on that list is coercive power. You use that one very, very rarely. Because when you use coercive power against anyone in your area, everyone becomes a little bit afraid. And the more people become afraid, the less they might be willing to share information with you. If you're really afraid of a department chair, or really afraid of a dean, or a provost, or a president, you may not tell that uh, academic leader things that he or she needs to know in order to be successful. And if that person doesn't have that information, that can undermine the person's uh, power and authority. Disasters can happen because they didn't hear in time that there was a problem in this area. So the more course of power you use, the more people become afraid of you. And some people think that fear is a great thing and they can get things done. But what fear prevents is other people confiding in you sharing information with you. So what uh, uh, we often talk about in our sessions about alternative ways of leading are different styles of leadership, things that we're going to talk about in other uh, webinars in the future. There's positive academic leadership. I can define this very briefly as saying that positive academic leadership is leading by focusing on what's working, not just trying to solve problems all the time, trying to build on um, the strengths of an organization, not just uh, trying to address all of its weaknesses. Then there's authentic academic leadership. Authentic academic leadership is realizing that you as an individual have certain values that define who you are, certain values that you would be willing to defend no matter what, and basing your philosophy of leadership on those particular values. And servant leadership is the approach that says that in the higher education, uh, a leader isn't really the top of any pyramid. A leader is a person who serves the students and the faculty members and the staff members in the area. Our job as leaders is to make their job, if not easier, then at least more effective. So in the course of other discussions that we may have in these webinars, we'll explore these different leadership types and what it can mean to help people become effective in the actual setting of, uh, of higher education leadership. So, so how do uh, academic leaders uh, actually get things done? Uh, sometimes people kind of laugh at, uh, at, uh, at some of these things on here, but actually these are all tools that every academic leader has in their academic toolkit. Do we command people? Yes, yeah, sometimes we do. We don't try not to do it very often, but sometimes you find yourself, the only way you can get something done is to say, look, I'm the chair, I'm authorized to make this decision, we're doing it. Sounds terrible to say we bribe people, and yet in some ways we do that all the time. Uh, look, I need someone to serve on the university promotion committee. Anyone want to do it? Anyone? No, no, no one wants to volunteer? Uh, uh, Juan, um, you wanted to go to that conference in Hawaii next year. Did, did you, uh, I'll tell you what, if you'll agree to serve on the promotion committee, I'm going to find funding, you can go. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll find a way. Well, basically, that's a bribe. And we do it as academic leaders all the time. Uh, do we pressure people? Do we manipulate people? We may not like to admit it, but we also do that. Uh, so uh, 
no one wants to serve on the university-wide uh, promotion committee. Um, Sophia, aren't you going up for promotion in a couple of years? You know, as your chair, I could write such a stronger letter for you. If I could say you served on a university-wide committee, sort of like the promotion committee. You sure you don't want to serve on it? I've just pressured or manipulated that person into saying yes. Managing through. This is the sort of leadership that your, your, your boss doesn't like, but sometimes we do this. Uh, managing through is when you say, oh, I'd love to help you. I'd love to make that decision for you. Unfortunately, I'm the chair and only deans get to make that decision. Managing through means you kick it upstairs. You throw it up to the next level. Do we ever beg people? I've seen academic leaders do this all the time. Come on, somebody's got to serve on the, we're not leaving this room until somebody agrees to serve on the committee. We can be here all day. Basically, you're just begging. And sometimes we hope we inspire people, but we're more likely to inspire people if we lead from our, our actual values, our principles, we're transparent about, about what it is that we're trying to do, rather than constantly trying to pressure people constantly trying to manipulate people and by using uh, leadership through command. So if you want to develop your academic leadership, Walt Gemelch says there are three things you have to do simultaneously. First of all, there's this thing he calls conceptual understanding or habits of mind. In other words, there's certain stuff you just got to know. You have to know how your university works. You have to know who's in charge of what. You have to know where the power lies and what you can negotiate and what you can't. And there are certain skills you have to develop, what he calls habits of practice. You have to be able to resolve conflict when conflict arises. You have to be able to interview people well so you know whom to hire. You have to be able to build uh, teams of, of uh, people in your program. But most important, he says, the part that most people tend to over forget is reflective practice, what he calls habits of heart. And habits of heart occur when every now and then we reflect and say, all right, what is it that I've done in the last month or in the last semester? What worked for me and what did? And I'll just share with you personally, for me, that was a better guide to becoming a good academic leader than all of those books on leadership I tried to buy when I was an early department chair. Thinking back on what I did and what might have, might have been effective in the program I was trying to chair, what was not effective because it didn't fit my style and the people I was working with, that habit of heart of reflecting on my own performance was the best teacher I ever had. So with that, I'd like to open it up to uh, a few minutes of any discussion or questions that yeah. people have. Have, uh, has. have any questions been raised so far? Thank no. you, Jeff. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no questions? No questions. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias a todos los participantes. Entonces, si alguno tiene alguna pregunta, es el momento. La pueden si quieren hacer en español y nosotros la, la traducimos acá. Ah, what's the difference between being a leader and being a boss? Uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, bosses uh, tend to uh, be the person who's just in charge. Bosses uh, are in charge through control. Leaders are uh, people who uh, create a positive change in organization through a whole variety of different ways. I'll give you a, a, a good, clear distinction between being a boss and, and uh, being a leader. You don't have to have a title to be a leader. Sometimes the most important leaders we have at universities, they're not the deans and they're not the department chairs. They could be a faculty member who, because of that person's moral stature, because of that person's ideas, because of that person's charisma, tends to be an opinion leader that other people follow. People are bosses because they're appointed bosses. And sometimes people who are in positions and see themselves as being in boss, uh, being a boss, focus so much on being in charge that they don't realize that other people have uh, brilliant ideas to contribute as well. So the difference between a boss and being a, a leader, a leader like, loves to be surrounded by brilliant people so they can all contribute brilliant ideas. Bosses tend to want to control brilliant people because they know 
that they are very hard to control and they may threaten the boss's position. They may someday become the boss. So to me, a leader is a person who creates progress in an organization by a whole variety of means. Bosses tend to have a title and tend to use that title control and may not create the sort of positive change that a leader can. Thank you for that question. That's a very interesting one. No. All right. No. One recommendation for chairs and being. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> One one recommendation for chairs and, and yeah. beans that we, we have. If I had to have, it was, just one, you yeah, just one. One. <laughs> one. one recommendation to, uh, for, would for, for I would say the most important thing is to never lose the habit of trying to see the world the way the people who report to you see the world, and seeing the world the way the person you report to sees sees the world. Because so often uh, academic leaders become blocked in, they get this myopia, this nearsightedness of only being able to see in the world in terms of a chair's problems or a dean's problems. If you can still feel what it's like to have those pressures on you as a faculty member, or if you're a, a dean as a department chair, and at the same time also understand the challenges your provost is going through. To me, that helps you more than anything else as an academic leader. Thank you. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? No. No. Okay. ¿Listo? Bueno, si no tenemos ninguna otra pregunta, queremos eh, agradecer muy especialmente este espacio con Jeffrey Buller. Muchísimas gracias por esta interesante webinar y discusión. Y también a todos los participantes, muchas, muchas gracias por haber participado, por haberse conectado. Y bueno, esperamos seguir eh, teniendo estas conversaciones acerca de este tema tan interesante como lo es el liderazgo académico. Entonces, bueno, muchísimas gracias a todos y que tengan una feliz tarde.